Welcome to another episode of Sit Down Startup Podcast. I'm Pedro. And I'm Tara. Thanks for staying with us. We've reached the midpoint of our first season, and we're happy to keep bringing you stories of entrepreneurs navigating the changing tides of 2020. So far, you've heard from founders and leaders on how to acquire new customers, how to build a community that focuses on customer retention, and how to bring empathy when creating your customer experience foundation. Our next guest is Bai Gan, Chief Product Officer at Zenny Optical. Zenny Optical is a leading online retailer of prescription eyewear. Based in Nevada, California, Zenny was founded on the belief that everyone should have access to high quality, stylish eyewear. Bai has been with the founder since the early days, which apparently started for him at a party full of biologists. To interview Bai, we invited Kristen Durham, VP of Startups at Zendesk. Kristen is passionate about the VC and startup world. She spent a long time at Silicon Valley Bank building their emerging market practice. And now she's leading Zendesk's strategy to build a strong community of startup customers. Are you ready? Let's sit down and start up. Oh, bye. It is so nice to be with you today. Um, I'm so excited for our chat. I, I actually woke up this morning and went down uh, to grab a coffee at the Stewart's Point store. Um, no, oh, I'm so jealous. Knowing how much we both like Sea Ranch. Um, did, you, did you get the sticky bun? No, not this morning. That, that's usually reserved for Saturdays only for me. Oh, Cool. And and so I got a cappuccino. I wanted to know what's what's your go-to coffee order? Sure. I'm also a very big fan of coffee, just super into the health benefits of coffee. Uh, it's simple, but then I drink it at 5.30 a.m. every day. So I grind and filter my coffee every day. Let the coffee do its own magic afterwards. So <laughs> <laughs> Great. I, I love anybody that starts by saying they drink coffee for the health benefits. I, uh, I'm <laughs> a man after my own, uh, after my own heart. Um, you know, I, I think right now, right, like the little pleasures for me, like coffee, uh, are like they mean so much more, I think, during a tough time. Yeah, I think, you know, having a routine is very helpful. Um, I think that really helps us with staying the course and then just kind of uh, weather some of the uncertainties that goes with dealing with COVID-19, obviously, which is unprecedented. But also just, uh, you know, before this pandemic, when I was traveling, I sort of have elements of my life that is routinized, the coffee, the reading, the walk. So no matter where I am in Italy or Shanghai, so I sort of stick to that routine I'm familiar with that give me a lot of comfort and confidence. Yeah, that's great to hear. Uh, I'm exactly the same way. You know, when when I used to travel for work, uh, a morning run was oftentimes the thing that I used to both uh, wake up and and get ready for the day, but also to to see the town. And now that I'm sequestered away in Sea Ranch, I'm I'm glad to still be able to do the same thing. For sure, the best place is to shelter shelter in place in the world. Yeah. Um, so in, in preparing for our, our chat today, you know, I've, I've been thinking uh, a lot about Zenny. Uh, you guys obviously have a very global business today. And, and maybe, you know, I, I'm curious just to, to hear a little bit about, you know, not just uh, both how you're managing by as well as how Zenny's managing through this time. Sure. Um, you mean, that that's exactly the point I was trying to bring up as well. Um, you know, we are just slightly ahead of the curve in terms of understanding the se severity and then be mentally prepared for the pandemic than a lot of our counterparts in the U.S. Because we have operation in China, we own our own manufacturing outside of Shanghai, uh, where the, you know, the pandemic first hit. Uh, and also we have partners throughout the globe. You know, uh, we even helped out in sending PPEs and masks to our partner in based in Bergamo, um, just outside of Milan, that was the sort of the um, the ground zero in Italy in terms of COVID nineteen. Then, as the pandemic kind of slowly move uh, across the globe to our part of the town, our hitting our community here in the U.S., uh, you know, we were pretty prepared mentally, but also procedurally, letting people. 
uh, you know, work from home, we were probably among the earliest, I would say, you know, uh, in the Bay Area because we just really saw the events unfolding. Uh, in terms of business operation, uh, we are extremely grateful for the kind of business model we have that is not, you know, um, heavy to rely on brick and mortar operation. So we are actually operating. Uh, we initially had some hit to the sales, you know, during uh, manufacturing closure and some of the interruption to the international logistics that we rely on. And also in February, when the consumer kind of sentiment was so low, they were holding out, we saw some downturn. But then we actually bounced back, you know, pretty well and then um, and actually doubled our year over year projection in the month of April and that continues into the end of May. We are actually beating um, our former projection right now. Um, so being very, very grateful and also trying to help um, the community as much as, as, as we can. That's fantastic. Um, I, I want to get back to, to, those, to, those, to those growing sales, um, but, but maybe first just kind of digging in a little you know, I think I think something that is to me very interesting about Zenny's story is that you know, down market is nothing new for you. You know, the company was actually born, I think, slightly after the dot com bubble burst, and and was one of the earliest direct to consumer companies out there. Um, though maybe you weren't at the startup, you know, as as a as an employee at the time. I know you were close to it. You know, what was what was that time like? Um, you know, when in in Zenny's early startup phase. Sure, uh, Zenny not only started um, during the market downturn, you know, the burst of the dot com uh, era, uh, but also uh, at the very beginning, you know, uh, the business model was not really recognized and appreciated by most people. Uh, so as you said, I was friend to the founders who started the company in the garage. And then just very quickly for people who are not familiar with Zenny, uh, Zenny is the largest online prescription eyewear company uh, in the U.S. in terms of uh, sales volume. Uh, we're probably 50% of the online market in the U.S. and we're you know, selling 20, 25,000 pairs of prescription eyewear a day. Uh, that is pretty much equivalent to, you know, 1,500 brick and mortar stores and putting us our volume on par with some of the, you know, largest uh, brick and mortar chains uh, in the country. Uh, but at the very beginning, um, I remember um, being introduced to the founders at a party that was actually largely populated by uh, biologists, academics, uh, and also business people. Uh, that was the shared friend circle uh, between me and the founders. Um, and I just do vividly remember, you know, um, how many people were not really committed to this idea. And then uh, even more so, you know, they politely walked away when they heard about, you know, uh, one of the founders, Tibor, talk talking about sort of how he just uh, started this uh, company selling prescription eyewear um, online. So I had very similar, um, you know, sentiment. I remember asking him, how do you try it on? You know, don't you need opticians to adjust your glasses? Uh, but then, uh, you know, 17 years later, now with our sales, um, you know, approaching uh, 300 million and then just really part, you know, being a partner with the Chicago Bulls, the 49ers, uh, many of the people who are regionally disbelieved in the business model now is, you know, increasingly attributing um, the success uh, almost singularly to the business model, which is kind of another interesting thing I learned working here um, that the execution is not overlooked, but but then actually plays an important role. I'll be happy to elaborate later too. Yeah, no, I to to have a successful startup, certainly you need you need that great idea to launch, but to get you know from from the early phases to get out of the gra garage, essentially, it, it takes a lot of execution, especially in, in the kind of business that you guys are in. Right. And, and also uh, a lot of the, uh, you know, executional decisions uh, were not anticipated. Uh, just to give, give some examples, you know, early on, you know, Zenny really focused its attention on building its own uh, infrastructure, you know, that is manufacturing instead of relying on suppliers. 
which in hindsight is, is really the, the, the thing that's giving us the foundation and all the advantages we enjoy today uh, compared to competitors. But then uh, from the vantage point of the, you know, the early, um, early days of Zenny, uh, I, I still feel it's very counterintuitive. You know, what would you do when you had full-time jobs and Julia Zen, uh, the founder, was still a full-time uh, biologist working for a biotech company as a scientist? Um, you know, what would you do when you first make your first $5 million, you know, out of your garage and then no debt, right? Uh, would you go for the easier way out and then just uh, go for a supplier? And many, I assure you, would, would promise, you know, the cheapest price, you know, any conditions you want to supply, to fuel your friend and e-commerce operation that focus on distribution and customer acquisition. But would you actually believe you, uh, could have the audacity to build a manufacturing that is better than people who have been running labs and then uh, managing optical uh, production for three decades. So for me, that was actually quite audacious. And even from per today's perspective, that's what I kind of meant by, you know, um, executional decisions that also um, uh, accumulatively led to where we are. Yeah, and those decisions, you know, and and in a time like we're in now, like really deciding what what those big bets are going to be, how they tie to the way you define the core competency for your startup. Um, I think there, I think there's some good lessons in there. Um, maybe maybe pivoting a little bit more, you know, to to your role as chief product officer, and I want to get into the customer because because I think that's actually another core competency uh, of Zinni's. Um, I, I'd love to, to hear a little bit more by about how you're approaching the needs of your customers uh, in this crisis, um, you know, both from, from a physical product standpoint, but then also kind of the, the broader customer uh, online experience that, that you're building too. Sure, sure. Very happy to explore that. And then obviously there's uh, the part of the traditional, you know, Zenny business model where we are providing prescription eyewear, which is an FDA regulated medical device. And then again, it is a, a life necessity for most people. Uh, I remember a few years back, um, I, I still read New York Times on paper, you know, like a physical paper on Sundays. Uh, then there was a, <laughs> uh, you know, that, that goes with the coffee too. So, <laughs> um, so uh, I remember reading this, uh, you know, kind of a headliner on New York Times Sunday that uh, I think titled something like uh, up to 2 billion people in the world still don't have access to prescription eyewear. Uh, and then the article talks about how that's becoming a health crisis globally, uh, you know, citing, you know, kind of really tragedies caused by um, or human and financial losses just caused by lack of access to prescription, prescription eyewear. Students who couldn't learn, you know, truck drivers in Nigeria, Nigeria would run into accident. Um, and largely, this is uh, also pointed, you know, the article pointed out uh, caused by cost, right? A pair of prescription eyewear costs two to three hundred dollars to buy. Uh, we're talking about the most simple single vision myopia correcting glasses. Uh, so Zenni's main offer, you know, alongside all, all our wonderful marketing and partnerships, is its core product and offering that allows us to sell uh, prescription eyewear at one tenth the brick and mortar price. Uh, by controlling manufacturing, by controlling our supply chain, we can develop uh, frames and lens product independently with partners, right? Um, you know, for example, the um, the currently the hottest the lens product we are uh, you know selling the blue blocker, which is a 420 nanometer cut uh, lens product that cuts all the harmful uh, high energy blue lights, was jointly developed by us and also the uh, chemical giant Mitsui Chemicals in Tokyo. Uh, that's quickly becoming our po most popular lens product because it is uh, a in-mass lens product 
the dye is blended instead of being a coating that only cuts a percentage of the blue lights and ours actually cuts everything below 420 nanometer. So that kind of shows sort of this, um, a vertically integrated model we have and how that delivers uh, value-packed product and services to consumers. I think that's the first and foremost. Yeah, I'll, I'll just say I love my pair of blue light blockers. I wear them. Uh, I do most of my news reading at night, and uh, I think it actually, you know, it's really critical to being able to fall asleep actually after after doing all that reading and and allowing my eyes to. For sure, and, and now I have, I have seen you in person, you know, from video. Uh, I have a lot of ideas for you. I think a lot of the the styles are gonna you're gonna love, and then. Uh, please allow me to send you some samples so that you can try. Uh, we most recently launched a uh, uh, co collection with uh, New York-based uh, fashion designer Cynthia Rowley. Uh, we have a partnership with uh, Rashida Jones. Uh, and then because of kind of our control with the OEM, ODM processes and designers, we can, we can really just have a lot of fun kind of quickly developing and com commercializing, you know, um, uh, not only styles, but also lens technologies like uh, the one I mentioned. Yeah, that's great. Um, but yeah, as we were talking the other day, though, it's it's there's a lot of innovation in the physical product, but to help consumers, oftentimes people who are buying a prescription, uh, who are buying prescription eyewear online for the first time, you know that that online customer experience is something that takes a lot of time and attention. And um, I think you mentioned that right now you're seeing a lot of first time purchasers. So so how do you how do you think about the the online component of the product experience and how you're helping your customers through that? Yeah, I'm glad you brought it up. And that's actually our uh, uh, biggest effort right now for this year. And then that, I think probably uh, extending beyond this year. Uh, is to continue to streamline our checkout processes uh, and then just use technology to facilitate that you know uh, online purchasing because again uh, product um, we're selling prescription eyewear is a customizable uh, product and then you do have to go through uploading your prescription um, you know sort of selecting lenses selecting upgrades if you want you know polarize the sunglasses or sort of the light changing you know tint changing photochromic transitions lenses uh, or mirror tints um, the amount of um, uh, you know upgrade and you know customization we offer is just can be you know um, uh, uh, intimidating you know uh, for sure uh, so we are definitely focused on kind of streamlining the checkout processes and also using, for example, virtual try-on. We currently have a video-based virtual try-on. You can actually uh, accurately, you know, scale your face and through a video format and to, to see how that uh, the frame and glasses are going to look on your face. And also auto pupillary distance tool, you know, the, the PD being the, the distance between the two pupils, between your, you know, two eyes. Uh, that sometimes is a pain point that people didn't know how to measure. So we are making that automated through, you know, through technology. Um, and also uh, the other aspect, you know, uh, that's um, a kind of a benefit of from our business model is data uh, that to date Zenny has sold 30 million pairs of uh, actually 30 to 33 million pairs of prescription eyewears to date uh, since our funding and then all that 30 million plus pairs uh, orders, right, uh, are all unique. Uh, data points because every pair is based on a unique frame, which we have 3,000 st styles to offer. And also, coupled with that, the unique prescription of the patient or customer, and also your lens choice as upgrades. Um, so, we kind of have this trove of data we can mine uh, in understanding kind of prescription preference. Just to give you a quick example, for example, we uh, heavily promote this lens material, high index lens material, which is a premium lens material called 161 index lens. Uh, that is really a 
beautiful lens material, um, you know, from technical point of view because it's very clear, has a very high quality, high level of RB number, which me measures chromatic aberration, which is my physicist talking. Uh, but also very versatile. It, it can be made into polarized, photochromic, you know, tinted, you know, mirror tints. And the other, the biggest advantage of 161 material is that it can cover uh, prescription needs of 90% of the population. Because as you can imagine, most of the people are having vision correction in the in 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 you know uh, with with a relatively weak prescription, right? The high prescription population is still kind of a one to five percent. So we could yeah. really sell one lens to cater the needs of many many people. So that we think is an opportunity for us to take a front seat role to recommend and guide the customers instead of letting them just customize your their, the whole thing. Yeah, that's, uh, I love that point, right? You know, 3000 pairs of glasses, all of these different options, it can, it can get overwhelming, right? You know, the, yeah. the, uh, the, the paralysis of choice can start setting in. And I think, you know, your ability to take options away and, and be more prescriptive when it comes to <laughs> so part in the pun prescription glasses I, I think you know for for an amateur buyer uh, you know there's so much value in that and I think it really demonstrates how you're thinking about the customers needs and and how as as a non-expert they're gonna go through that process and be successful and, and satisfied at the end of it absolutely. Cool. Um, maybe uh, I know that I know that I know that you've got to run. I, I was just curious to, to ask one thing. Um, you know, as as we're, we've kind of been talking about Zenny back in in the early startup days and Zenny now, is there anything that strikes you from the culture, the the founding culture of the company that is still really holding true for you guys at your current scale? Um, are there are there pieces of that of that history that you continue to nurture and and bring to the forefront of, of how you guys do business every day? Yeah, I mean, um, Zenny was really founded with a very altruistic um, ideal. Um, I mean, many companies say so, but then I I'm very touched and convinced of the sincerity of that point. Uh, from early on, we actually, uh, our, pri our pricing strategy really demonstrated um, how we were driving for, driving for ultimate efficiency. When we first started, was, uh, we were $29 glasses when the closest competition was selling $39. But then that's when we just really didn't figure out our cost structure, and then we're relying on supplies, uh, suppliers and supply chains heavier than what we are today. But then we quickly lowered our price to $15.95 and then to $6.95. Um, you can actually buy a pair of high-quality prescription eyewear from Zenny for $6.95, which is the cost of a you know cup of caramel latte, just trying to get him back to your coffee theme there. Yeah. Um, this the seven dollar glasses is actually a um, high quality prescription eyewear. I mean, I wish I could show you the kind of machineries we use in a factory. They're all German, Swiss, Italian, top of the line edgers, polishers, and generators. Um, and in order to uh, provide that kind of cost to consumers, it is really the scale. It is actually not a lack of quality. Um, that is making it possible. So $7 glasses is actually not cheap, it's extremely difficult to do. So in to large extent, we're still driven by this ideal, this mission. We're trying to share the most benefits with consumers. Um, and then I feel like that drives our decision. Our mission is actually not just to maximize our profit. And then as you might know, we don't have any uh, investors. Uh, all our factory and our um, back-end manufacturing capability was uh, self-funded uh, that was just basically funded by the profit we generated over the years. 
and will continue to do so. Currently, we have 1 million square feet of manufacturing facility based also outside of Shanghai. We fully control. We, we, we build everything. We'll continue to do so until we are able to provide prescription eyewear to everyone in the world who need it. And then I think that's also a very important and potent recruiting tool for us to attract like-minded people. I mean, many of our employees have that ideal. Um, you know, that is also very characteristic of the San Francisco Bay Area residents. Um, you know, some have very strong prescriptions. Some uh, of our employees are, you know, creative, you know, director. Tony actually has eye condition uh, that he had to deal with as a kid. So we have many employees just like that who are working here um, empowered by that ideal. So I think we'll continue to do that and then until we reach everyone who needs them. That's fantastic. I, I like having such a strong sense of mission, letting that drive the company through through all of its iterations. I think, you know, that's that's a wonderful thing and, and a wonderful um, kind of, uh, you know, take away here, here at the end of our time together. I think for us, it's in us too, right? You know, we, we think about the customer, we talk about the customer a lot and, and serving others. And, and one thing that has been really exciting for me to watch is, is that even as we're all staying at home, uh, still as a company looking for a lot of ways to volunteer and to make sure that we're out serving as a service company, I think is, um, you know, is, is something that's that's quite special. Um, yeah, and, and really thank you for the opportunity to share our story. We um, strongly believe in um, giving back. And then that's also why recently we've been also donating masks and some PPEs to hospitals and doctors. Um, so I think this is all part of our culture. Our culture is one that we are driven by these ideals and driven by the impact we make. So thank you again for this opportunity to share with you and also your audience of um, our story. Yeah, thanks for swinging by. And uh, when we when we get out of this, I, I'm certainly hoping we can get together, uh, maybe even uh, up at the Sea Ranch. I would love that. Thanks for joining us by, it's great to hear Zenith's growth and how you're building an excellent product for your customers. Besides Sea Ranch being the best place to shelter in place in the world, what's your main takeaway from today's episode? Not sure if everyone agrees with you on that one, Pedro, but Bai and Kristen are clearly Sea Ranch lovers. I'll have to make my way over there someday. Zenny has a fascinating story of early adoption and industry disruption. Zenny was one of the first eyewear companies that decided to go directly to consumers. And by doing so, they could sell their products at one-tenth of the cost of a brick and mortar store. And these savings, of course, show up in their prices. Another not so obvious but key benefit of going direct to consumer is that Zenny can gather customer data themselves. This empowers them to improve their customer experience from beginning to end. And if you like this episode, tune in next with Sophia Ballet, co-founder at Code Signal. Don't forget to rate us on your podcast of choice. Subscribe and share. It's summertime. Give yourself a Zoom break. And when Pedro and I are not recording this podcast, we are part of Zendesk for Startups. If you're a startup, go to www.zendesk.com forward slash startups and sign up to join our program. Qualify companies get six months free of Zendesk software for customer support, sales, and customer engagement teams. They also get connected with our exclusive community of leaders and partners who are changing the landscape of customers' experiences. Talk to you next time. Stay hungry. Stay hungry.